The benefits of introducing higher levels of fat into your diet are going to be erased and even made worse if you don't at the same time cut your sugars and carbs. Right. The high fiber carbs notwithstanding. And humans have been on this brand new diet that we've been talking about for well over two million years. I mean, generally, uh, our state of metabolism was pretty much in a low grade of ketosis almost throughout the year for as long as we've been walking the planet because we didn't have carbs. We wouldn't stumble upon a wheat field or an apple orchard or, you know, uh, quarts of orange juice to be nice about it. We could be not so nice about it. So there's you know, a lot of research going on in terms of being on a ketogenic diet, in terms of weight loss, in terms of activating gene pathways that you mentioned to reduce inflammation, to amplify mitochondrial health and reduce free radical production. Uh, actually using ketogenic diet as a therapeutic intervention for cancer. Hey folks, welcome back to High Intensity Health Radio. It's Mike Mutzel here. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm very excited to be live with my friend, Dr. David Perlmutter. Today we're gonna to talk about his new book, The Grain Brain Whole Life Plan. Some pearls, sound bites, nuggets we're gonna talk about from the book. And I think Dr. Perlmutter, a great place to launch and kind of commend you about your work is we know now that the New York Times launched the article two or three weeks ago about the fraud in the, med in the medical literature about the importance of carbohydrates and how we know that may not have a scientific basis. You've been talking about that for a very long time. And also the ketogenic diet is now just exploding and this is another therapy you've been talking about for 10 plus years. So I wanna commend you for uh, introducing these novel ideas to us. But let's talk about carbohydrates. Because some people still believe they should be a dietary staple. Share with us your backstory. Well, I don't think it's fair to castigate all carbohydrates. For example, we know that there are some carbohydrate-based foods that are fiber-rich that are actually very, very good for you. But I think, you know, by and large, the carb consumption in modern cosmopolitan diets is way over the top. Yeah. And it's not just complex carbohydrates, but simple sugars as well. And it's absolutely wreaking havoc with our metabolism, you know, challenging our insulin sensitivity, changing our gut microbiome, the bacteria that live there. Yeah. And really, I think the cornerstone failure of our modern diet. And as you mentioned, I mean, here, the New York Times uh, talks about a JAMA article that recently uh, came out that indicated that there was real subterfuge going on back in the late 1960s mm -hmm. with powerful influence on the part of the sugar industry in terms of what was being published in the New England Journal of Medicine, arguably wow. one of the most well-respected peer-reviewed medical journals on the planet. And that whole mentality influenced by the industry who had an interest in this changed the dietary recommendations of, uh, that our government agencies were making changed the diets of Americans and really uh, in Western cultures uh, around the world and really led to a profound increase in the chronic degenerative conditions. And I would say that that one event, that one idea of undermining what we should be eating, probably led to more deaths prematurely than World War I and World War II combined. Mm -hmm. And would you attribute that to the dysglycemia or the effects in the brain and, or all of the above? Well, well there are many more. Yeah. It's going to be in all of the above, but there are many, many uh, ways that uh, the dietary change was profoundly negative. The dysglycemia, of course, being the changes in blood sugar and, more importantly, our ability to regulate our blood sugar. Therefore, insulin is certainly implicated. Uh, but the other thing is it paved the way for people to begin eating uh, food that had very little nutritional quality in it. Yeah. Uh, what became the favored food were foods which were advertised and promoted as being no fat or low fat. Uh, and so then uh, really nutrient devoid uh, foods became very, very popular. Mm -hmm. The cereals, the breads, uh, you know, the, the various baked goods grain-based uh, baked goods, mm -hmm. getting people away from foods that they were so desperate for, including foods that contained what they called the dreaded fat, right. which we've been eating for a couple of million years and are fundamentally critical for human health and disease resistance. You know, the World Health Organization now puts chronic degenerative conditions on the very top of the list in terms of causes of death in, death in humans worldwide, not just in developed countries. It is no longer uh, infectious uh, issues. So uh, it's, it's very sobering because the chronic degenerative conditions are lifestyle induced and number one on that list uh, is nutrition.
Mm, yeah, very big, important point. I like how you kind of quantify that and, and qualify that a little bit in the sense that not all carbohydrates are bad because you talk a lot about the microbiome and you've been talking about this for a long time. And I think people can kind of forget about the fiber and the prebiotics and the beneficial properties of a healthy diet for the microbiome, right? So how do you kind of reconcile that for people? Well, it's, it's a terrific question. And I think it really has to do with um, gaining a recognition as to what we should be eating. And again, not necessarily castigating carbohydrate, fat, or protein as a macronutrient group that is bad. Yeah. Uh, but it's the type of protein, for example. It's whether it's grass-fed beef versus GMO, glyphosate-treated, antibiotic-derived uh, animals, uh, and the same thing with carbohydrate. Uh, that fiber-rich, uh, nutrient-dense vegetables, for example, that have a lot of prebiotic fiber to nurture the gut microbiome, uh, things like jicama or Mexican yam, dandelion greens, garlic, onions, leeks, asparagus. These are foods that are basically uh, carbohydrate to some degree, contain mm -hmm. carbohydrate, dense uh, fiber, but they are metabolized by mostly by the gut bacteria. And as such, nurtures the probiotics, allows them to replicate and allows them to do all the great things that our good bugs do within us, making vitamins having a role to play in our neurotransmitter production, balancing uh, our production of things like uh, vitamin K, the B group, keeping the gut epithelium intact so we reduce the permeability of the gut uh, lining, which is really fundamental to the process of inflammation. Mm -hmm. And that gets back to our, uh, the statement about chronic degenerative conditions plaguing the world. These are, by and large, inflammatory conditions. So mm -hmm. when we talk about coronary artery disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, cancer, these are inflammatory disorders and therefore have a direct relationship uh, to what goes on in the gut and therefore have a direct relationship to the foods that we choose to eat. And that was the big issue with respect that uh, these changes were adopted uh, mm -hmm. by the USDA uh, saying that sugar isn't all bad, we've got to blame somebody else. And you know, your, your viewers need to know that we're having this discussion, what, three weeks before the presidential election, yeah. and it's all about blame. Right. So um, when, when sugar didn't want to be the scapegoat, they reached out and said, we'll blame uh, uh, fat. Yes, let's blame fat. Yeah. They chose fat out of the hat, and suddenly the right diet was uh, to be identified, the right foods, by the moniker of low fat or no fat. Mm -hmm. And those foods, you know, even uh, avocados and nuts were taken off the list because they contained the dreaded fat. Yeah. And to this day, they're still, it's changing as you know, right now. Right. But uh, various cereals are considered healthy because they contain whole grain, whereas fat foods like avocados and nuts and seeds are considered unhealthy by virtue of their fat content. And these are foods that are emulate what we've eaten for hundreds of thousands of years. Suddenly some scientist in a, in a lab, uh, or worse, tells us we shouldn't eat these foods and we should eat low nutrient uh, density uh, carbohydrates. Yeah, that's really scary. I definitely want to tackle fat in a more of a deep dive, but I uh, want to finish off a little bit on the gut. And one of the therapies that you've kind of introduced to healthcare practitioners is uh, the use of probiotics for brain health and various diseases. You mentioned inflammation. And you talked about, in one of the seminars, I think in 2012 at IFM, about using rectal suppositories of probiotics. Is that still something you recommend? And well, I don't know uh, that there is a commercially available uh, suppository of probiotic. Now, uh, what I had talked about back then was actually yeah. enemas of probiotics. I mean, it doesn't mm. sound uh, very tasteful, but uh, as a matter of fact, uh, why not? Yeah. I mean, we've known that the procedure called fecal microbial transplant uh, has been done for at least 50 years, if not uh, longer, dating back actually to ancient Chinese medicine, uh, but has been at least published for at least 50 years, beginning, oddly enough, in a surgery journal, which I think is great. Uh, but the notion of giving probiotics and or fully formed microbiomes via the rectal route, I think, offers up huge potential. Mm -hmm. We now recognize that in more than 500 hospitals in America, fecal microbial transplant, that's the official name, FMT, is being performed, but specifically for one indication, and that is the treatment of Clostridium difficile, which, oddly enough, may be the prototypic illness uh, indicative of a disrupted microbiome. Mm -hmm. How do you get C. diff? You get it by taking 
uh, acid blocking drugs which disrupt the pH and kill off certain bacteria or you get it when you're taking antibiotics to again disrupt the complexity and the diversity of your gut microbiome and oddly enough how the um, mainstream has treated uh, C. diff uh, diarrhea has been more antibiotics things like vancomycin for example mm -hmm. a very uh, aggressive antibiotic so uh, I think that uh, old habits die hard and mm -hmm. the you know success rate of FMT fecal microbial transplant in treating C. diff is somewhere hovering around 94 to 96 percent the, the the approved standard treatment using antibiotics is about 26 to 28 percent effective mm -hmm. And there's not a downside of FMT provided you screen the donor appropriately who's mm -hmm. giving the fecal material that is then used. Yeah, so that's a, a therapy that you'd recommend for someone that has had antibiotics or uh, you talk about in the book, people that are born via C-section, weren't breastfed. You know, if they're uh, tr struggling with these different chronic diseases, you might uh, recommend FMT for someone? Well, I might. I mean, I, I think that uh, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that any child born by C-section should have a fecal microbial transplant. Sure. I would defer to the work of Dr. Maria Dominguez Bello at NYU, who has published a series of papers, one more, uh, very recently in the journal Nature, uh, where she uh, has advocated, and I talked about it in my last book, uh, Brain Maker, uh, putting a swab in the uh, vaginal birth canal prior to mother undergoing c-section mm -hmm. and actually prior to mother getting the inter mandatory intravenous antibiotics that seem to be required for c-section and then keeping that in a warm moist environment and then after the baby is born inoculating his or her face and mouth uh, with the contents of the birth canal to inoculate and really anoint that now child uh, mm -hmm. with the seeds for his or her uh, microbiome her more recent paper that was just published in Nature uh, demonstrated that there is persistence of those specific organisms when they check the stool of the child many months out and are, they're able to genotype those organisms based upon what they took from mother and then what they recover from the baby's stool. So, wow. uh, you know, we're just in a very nascent period in understanding the potential for that. I mean, again, a third of births in America are born by cesarean, and that deprives that child of uh, the balance setting of his or her immune system, uh, the degree of inflammation that he or she may experience. Uh, you mentioned diabetes. Uh, you know, these kids are at in dramatically increased risk for type 1 diabetes, for celiac disease, for ADHD, autism, and even uh, other issues uh, like becoming obese as an adult based upon being born by C-section. And theoretically, therefore, the connection is to the changes that didn't happen to the microbiome. Right. Yeah, it's very, very scary. So a lot of people ask about that. Um, how can they restore their microbiome through diet? And, and so one of the things that, you know, has been popularized through the Sonnenbergs and so forth is eat a high, and you talked about this a little bit earlier, eat a high fiber, high phytonutrient complex diet. And, uh, but the, the kind of corollary there is in the uh, gut microbiome research, they're kind of anti-fat. You know, how they induce metabolic endotoxemia is by giving uh, these animals high fat. So high fat and high sugar. Right. If you look at the research, yeah. it's a very important point. So if you people are looking at research that shows that a high fat diet changes the microbiome in laboratory animals, uh, the take home point is it's a high fat, high sugar diet. And the same thing happens in humans you know, the benefits of introducing higher levels of fat into your diet mm -hmm. are going to be erased and even made worse if you don't at the same time cut your sugars and carbs. Right. The high fiber carbs notwithstanding. And, you know, you mentioned the Sonnenberg. So they're at Stanford University and it's a husband and wife team. Uh, they just put out a very uh, interesting uh, study where they took uh, laboratory animals uh, and deprived them of prebiotic fiber. Mm. And there was a dramatic loss of diversity of the gut bacteria, which is not a positive thing, over time. They then reintroduced prebiotic fiber into their diets, and what they found was they were able to a significant degree restore the gut microbial diversity. But with succeeding generations, uh, up to the third generation, what they demonstrated was that some species by that time became extinct and could not be recovered. Wow. So the recoverability, I think, of the microbiome, if we want to extrapolate that data to humans, 
uh, generation after generation, we're getting deeper and deeper into a hole. And our microbiomes now uh, are getting further and further away from the microbiomes of people uh, extent today in rural environments, as well as our ancestors. And we are clearly able uh, to determine what was the genotype of the organisms of our ancestors. We have technology that can actually look at sequencing uh, the material found in fossilized fecal material as well as the uh, material that, that, that forms calculus around the base of the teeth. Uh, both of these technologies, the, the teeth one calculus uses what's called next-gen sequencing mm. and tells us that there has been a, a fairly uniform or oral as well as gut microbiome for thousands and thousands of years. That is very different from what we're seeing today in cosmopolitan people but very similar to what we still see in people living in very, very rural, undeveloped areas like Burkina Faso, for example, is one of the big studies that has been looked at. So it's, it's a big uh, eye-opener in terms of the environmental, i.e. our food choices, effects and drug choices on changing the microbiome that has been really very stable. Uh, the oral studies that looked at changes in the oral microbiome found two dramatic periods of time when there were changes and that was 10,000 years ago, and then more recently, 200 years ago. That was when the big changes occurred, correlating very nicely with A, human development of agriculture, and B, uh, a understanding how to extract sugar from food and process sugar and make it available. Hmm, that's really interesting because we've heard so much about evolutionary nutrition for a long time, Weston A. Price and others, Francis Pottinger and so forth, and I think the microbiome, we didn't understand bacteria as well as we do now back then. So what you're saying is there's a transgenerational effect of the microbiome, uh, a reduction in diversity. You know, this is passed down through that's generations, right. which is powerful. It is powerful. Well, that is, again, uh, based on Sonnenberg's work, if we sure. want to extrapolate the animal data to humans, and I think I have no reason to reject that. I mean, uh, uh, and I think there there is some evidence now that, that things are actually transgenerational and even skip a generation. We inherit uh, at least some genomic changes from our grandparents, it's been mm. demonstrated. And those can be... Uh, even epigenetic issues that they experience can be translated to our uh, to grandchildren. So, you know, this notion of very a very static genome, very static DNA, I think, uh, is really thrown out the window. It's what we all grew up on. That mm -hmm. DNA was locked in a glass case. We then moved to a, a time of understanding epigenetics, where various lifestyle factors, be it stress or lack of sleep, and certainly nutritional. Uh, components would change the expression of various gene pathways, either for the good or the bad, uh, either amplifying inflammation, for example, or augmenting our production of antioxidants. And we call that uh, epigenetic modulation, and, and uh, that, was, that was a major shift. Mm -hmm. uh, that DNA was not locked in the glass case, that we control our genetic destiny. Well, we now know that the microbiome, the organisms within us, are actually influencing our genetic expression as well. They, uh, through their activities, are changing the expression of the 23,000 gene genome that we inherited from mom and dad. And it really is yet another call for us to be very careful about how we treat our friends that live within us because they are holding the keys to our genetic expression to some degree. That's beautiful. Now, if we want to take a deep dive into the mechanisms, is it their fermentation byproducts like butyric acid, or is it the crosstalk within the immune system, if we want to drill down a little bit? Well, let's first uh, take the, um, the metabolites, and, sure. and certainly uh, there are a lot of metabolites. There are a whole series of short-chain uh, uh, short metabolites that influence uh, the ribosomes uh, of the uh, within you know the, our, our cells that influence genetic expression in, in a number of ways. Uh, beyond that, uh, certainly there's a lot of research now looking at the short chain fatty acids and looking at butyrate in specific. Mm -hmm. You know, we used to say, well, butyrate is the preferred fuel of the colonocyte. And that was as much as we needed to know. It was answer B, yeah. and then you go on to the next question. Well, we now know that butyrate is a critically important. Uh, product of uh, some of the bacteria that live within us uh, and that it regulates gut permeability. It is a messenger molecule having significant epigenetic activity 
and even uh, seems to regulate the permeability of the blood-brain barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we're just beginning to understand how butyrate uh, itself is involved in, gen in our genetic expression. So it's, it's way more than just you know, an interesting short-chain fatty acid. Yeah. Acetate uh, and uh, uh, propionate also are found. And, you know, there there's, tends to be this push to look upon butyrate is good and propionate is, is bad. We don't mm -hmm. want propionate because of its effects on, negative effects on gene expression. It's uh, downregulation, for example, of glutathione. But I think it's, we're learning it's more about balance. I mean, you know, it's like free radicals are all bad, but mm -hmm. no, they're not. We need free radicals to help us purge ourselves of, that's the mechanism that allows us to rid ourselves of dangerous viruses, bacteria, et cetera, cancer cells as well. We need inflammation to do positive things, take care of injury, et cetera. So I, you, know, you don't come off saying that we'll do everything we can to increase butyrate and get rid of propionate. Mm -hmm. You know, that said, when we see the work of uh, Dr. Derek McFabe at uh, Western Ontario, who's looking at the role of propionate as a consequence of changes in the diversity of the gut bacteria, uh, and the role that that might play in autism, having demonstrated some very powerful research in the laboratory animal, yeah. it's very compelling. But again, I think ultimately it's all about uh, balance. Yeah. Um, you know, there are a variety of uh, products of a bacterial um, uh, metabolism that have a huge effect on us in terms of directly our metabolic uh, set points as well as in terms of epigenetics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure the three short chain fatty acids that you mentioned, acetate, propionate, and prudrate, are just the tip of the iceberg and we'll learn so many more metabolites. One of them, the TMAO, has come up. So where do you stand on that one? Because I know we'll talk about fat in a little bit, but just to preface that, there, you know, the carnitine in eggs and meat products have been attributed to these metabolites that may or may not increase uh, risk of heart disease. Is that a con real concern? I know that was in... To me, it's not a, 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 a real concern. So uh, what, what you're talking about, TMAO, trimethylamine oxide, is a bacterial metabolite that some research may have connected uh, to increased risk of coronary artery disease. And having said that, I think what we fully understand is TMAO is a manifestation of a certain bacterial milieu then processing the carnitine Mm -hmm. uh, found in meat or carnitine in and of itself and producing this metabolite. So I think it gets back to not just a thing like carnitine or a thing like TMAO, but what is the bigger picture in terms of how are these things uh, looked upon through the lens of the microbiome, which has a role to play in making this a positive or negative experience. Uh, you know, carnitine, of course, the word carnitine comes from carne, meaning Latin for meat, and that's been the argument because carnitine uh, comes from meat, therefore meat is bad. Mm. Well, I, I would say, tell that to the past 500 generations of humans that meat is bad. And, you know, frankly, would we have made it to this point had we not had access to that type of protein? Yeah. Uh, I think, again, it gets to a, a quality issue. Do I think that eating meat is a good practice? No, I don't think so when we're looking at all types of meat. We look at the studies that correlate meat consumption with things like colon cancer and coronary artery risk, et cetera. Some of those studies have actually reached conclusions that meat consumption is a bad thing and we should be basically vegetarian. And I agree with their conclusions based upon their data, but I strongly disagree with the type of data that they used. It's not fair to talk about meat consumption uh, and not differentiate between grass-fed beef and again, meat, beef from a, a cattle that's been fed genetically modified food that is laced with Roundup, glyphosate, that studies uh, indicate will change the human microbiome and have been treated with antibiotics, which then further damage the human microbiome. That's why they're called antibiotics. They work and they've been used in raising cattle and poultry since the late 1950s because they make animals fatter. And how do they do that? They do that by changing the microbiome. So fat is an inflammatory tissue. Coronary artery disease is an inflammatory condition. That can relate the type of meat that people eat and therefore the risk for coronary artery disease. Um, 
that's a long way from the carnitine and TMAO story. Yeah, right. So really to kind of summarize that is researchers are comparing different phenotypes of meat. You know, they're comp comparing apples to oranges, really, when it comes down to Exactly it. right. And again, I would urge uh, when people see research that says eating meat is a threat for this reason or that reason, look at the study and recognize that they aren't differentiated between eating grass-fed beef high in omega-3s, which reduce inflammation, as compared to high omega-6 uh, grain-fed uh, animals that have been, again, given antibiotics and eating grain that's been treated with glyphosate, that's, that's a powerful threat to your health. I wouldn't yeah. go near that stuff. Right, and you talk about testing for glyphosate in the book, which I think is profound. No one's really addressed that to that, my knowledge. And it's just beginning. The, yeah. uh, the FDA has indicated, uh, who knows when it's going to happen, but I did, it, luckily I had the chance to put that, uh, it was just announced, mm. testing for glyphosate uh, residues in our food. And uh, mm. you know, glyphosate is the, the largest used herbicide on the planet. Uh, it's mm. estimated next year, 1.35 million metric tons of this poison is going to be sprayed on the food that we eat. I mean, that's a scary proposition. We're right. putting poison on our food. <laughs> what do you not understand that, about that? Yeah, scary stuff. Uh, definitely, you know, t well, I'm sure we can talk more about glyphosate, but again, you know, we, when we introduced this, um, this podcast about something that you pioneered, the ketogenic diet, which now is emerging faster, in my opinion, than the microbiome story, right? It's this new revolutionary breakthrough. But again, this is a therapy you've been talking about for a long time. And we talked about epigenetics, how environment our environment changes our gene expression. We know the main ketone body, beta-hydroxybutyrate, changes our genetic expression and affects the brain. So talk to us a little bit, Dr. Perlmutter, about ketosis, intermittent fasting, high-fat diets. You know, there's so much controversy and speculation there, like, what should I do? And you talk about this in the book. Well, well first, I, I am not going to lay claim to having originated the ketogenic diet, right. not in any, any way. I mean. The first medical literature talking about a ketogenic diet appeared in around 1928 as a therapy for epilepsy. And you know, be, uh, beyond that, uh, humans have been uh, on this you know, brand new diet that we've been talking about for well over two million years. I mean, generally, uh, our state of metabolism was pretty much in a low grade of ketosis almost throughout the year for as long as we've been walking the planet because we didn't have carbs. We wouldn't stumble upon a wheat field or, field or an apple orchard or mm. you know, uh, quarts of orange juice uh, to be nice about it. We could be not so nice about it. So gee, there's uh, you know, a lot of research going on in terms of uh, being on a ketogenic diet in terms of weight loss, in terms of activating gene pathways that you mentioned to reduce mm. inflammation, to amplify mitochondrial health and uh, reduce free radical production, uh, actually using ketogenic diet as a therapeutic intervention for cancer. Uh, so uh, there's, a, there's plenty of research. Dr. Thomas Safield uh, wrote a wonderful book about treating cancer with a, a ketogenic diet. You know, our mission way back when uh, on, in writing Grain Brain was to say, you know, it's really the preferred fuel of the brain, though we were all taught, no, no, the brain needs sugar day and night, therefore, you know, go and eat your payday or Kit Kat bar, and that's, you're doing your brain a service. Yeah. You're shooting yourself in the foot when you do that, because actually glucose is highly toxic for the brain. It is poisonous to the brain. Yeah. Uh, you eat glucose, your blood sugar goes up, and the more your blood sugar goes up, the higher risk you have for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, September of 2013, New England Journal of Medicine looked at a group of 667 people and followed them, I think, for close to seven years. Actually, it was a larger group than that. And they did one single test on these people. And they measured at the beginning of the study, these are non-demented elderly individuals, they measured a very sophisticated test called their blood sugar, fasting blood sugar. They followed them for about seven years and they found that those individuals who had even subtle elevations of blood sugar had a dramatic increased risk for becoming demented. Mm -hmm. And these were blood sugar measurements of like 105, 110, where you know, most doctors are going to say, hey, like you did, shrug your shoulders. No biggie here. Yeah. You're fine. You're not diabetic with the word yet hanging up in, in the sky. Mm -hmm. But you know, we need to redefine not just what is normal, and normal is what is average. That's how we get our norms for our blood levels. Mm -hmm. But what is optimal? What is best for people? And normal is not having a blood sugar of 100. Right. It's not having a hemoglobin A1C of 
uh, ate. It should be lower. We want, uh, you know, normal is he should be healthy. Mm -hmm. So we want to look at optimizing blood parameters by optimizing diet. Right. And one of the best ways to optimize blood sugar regulation is through a higher fat, lower carb diet is what we're trying to say. And that's been demonstrated in study after yeah. study. Uh, not just blood sugar uh, issues, but also um, uh, dietary uh, lipid profiles and even markers of inflammation like C-reactive protein. That goes way back to the A to Z study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Uh, the, the study that won was the A, the Atkins, the Z being the zone diet, uh, and um, you know, the, the A to Z. T was traditional, O was Ornish. Mm. And the Ornish diet failed significantly in comparison to the Atkins diet on the parameters of weight loss and uh, blood sugar parameters as well. Mm. Uh, like it or not, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not pointing fingers at people, I'm pointing fingers at recommendations. Yeah. Because the Atkins diet was at least closer to the paleo diet, and you can you know, talk about that name paleo diet however you like, but the mission of calling that particular diet the paleo diet was an attempt to get us back into sync between our environmental issues like diet and what our genome and the genomes of our microbiome expect. Mm -hmm. And one of the practices that our ancestors, our paleolithic ancestors, uh, whether they wanted to or not, participated in was this intermittent fasting, this feast and famine. You talk about in, that in the book and how it increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor and much more. So on a practical level, uh, what have you found personally? I mean, obviously you're very cognizant and sharp and articulate. Um, you practice what you preach, I know. So uh, how does one go about 21st century intermittent fasting? Mm. What was the know? question? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me clarify a few things sure. for you because you threw some things out there that I just want everybody to understand. So Mike mentioned uh, something called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And uh, BDNF uh, we can consider to be like growth hormone for the brain. It, uh, it plays a role in the growth of new brain cells, who knew, uh, in, and also the, uh, the way that cells connect, called neuroplasticity, and also the way that our synapses form, which are neuron connected to neur neuron, which is called uh, synaptic plasticity as well. So we really want to have lots of BDNF. In a study that appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Association, they actually measured BDNF levels on a group of individuals and then followed them over time and determined that those people who had the lowest BDNF ended up having the highest risk for uh, developing dementia. So you want to get your BDNF levels as high as you possibly can. And how do you do that? You mentioned intermittent fasting and going into a state of ketosis. That's one way. Uh, the next uh, powerful way that, and I'm not ranking these, but a very powerful way is aerobic exercise. Yeah. Uh, as demonstrated um, by researchers at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, uh, Dr. Kirk Erickson was a lead author in the study that demonstrates when you aerobically exercise, you actually bump up your BDNF level. You can measure that. Uh, and in addition, uh, you in, they've demonstrated increased growth of cells in your brain's memory center called the hippocampus. They measured that on MRI studies, on a special type of voxel imagery that shows an increased size over two years of your brain's memory center. Now who's not gonna wanna have that? And a reduced risk of dementia. Multiple researchers have demonstrated reduced risk of dementia in people who simply aerobically exercise. You don't need a script, you don't need a special magic pill. You need to buy a new pair of, of sneakers and you need to do something for 20 minutes a day that gets your heart rate up. Um, the other issues that are players in terms of raising BDNF, uh, the herb turmeric, which has uh, been used for thousands of years, and the literature on turmeric that relates it to reduced risk of, of mental decline goes back about 3,000 years. So you want to do a literature search, that's not going to show up on Google. Mm. Uh, but also DHA, the omega-3, has a significant role to play in bumping up the production of this brain growth hormone called BDNF. And the work of Martha Claire Morris at Rush University has demonstrated uh, that those individuals with the highest level of DHA consumption have the lowest risk for dementia. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's also whole coffee uh, fruit extract, uh, which has um, been used, has been written about now in the, in the research and will soon be something that's available uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a product, I, su I suspect. But you know, these are lifestyle issues. These are non-prescription ways because there is no prescription way to increase your brain's memory center size and functionality. 
and make you more resistant to dementia. But you can use turmeric, get some aerobic exercise, take some DHA, uh, you end intermittently fast. Get yourself into a state of ketosis that you mentioned. Sure. Yeah, it's beautiful. In the book, you talked about 450 minutes per week, which is a little bit higher than some other people are recommending. Well, that's not just aerobics. That 450 right. minutes per week is for total body health. Mm -hmm. We have exercises for upper body, lower body, uh, limbs, arms, and legs, uh, cardiovascular, so and stretching as well. Yeah. So uh, and ab work, uh, which I think is very important. Core work. So. You know, this is a new book for me, and it plays upon my other two books, which were Grain Brain and, and Brain Maker. And I like to say that Grain Brain and Brain Maker talked about why. Why are these things happening? Why we're getting sick? Why lowering our sugar and carbs is important? Why taking probiotics and eating fermented food and to eating prebiotic food is important? The new book is all about uh, how. How do you then implement? Mm -hmm. Why is sleep so important? Uh, why is reducing stress so important? How uh, forgiveness is important and gratitude plays such a, a pivotal role in your health, being grateful. Uh, but of course, mentioning, and in, not, in, 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 not just in a short way, but significantly getting into the, the diet part of the story, but also looking at, uh, as you talked about at the beginning of the interview, how uh, these ideas which were originally thought to be a little bit out there are now mainstream front and center mm -hmm. that yeah it wasn't fat it was the sugar and the carbs which is what we said you know I took my lumps for that but uh, uh, that's okay uh, you know now there's validation and I'm really happy about that yeah yeah that's profound and, and one of the non prescription or non uh, uh, supplemental recommendations that you recommend the gratitude and the meditation I thought that was really profound uh, as we kind of transition here to some quick final questions. Anything about meditation or your particular practice? I know you probably do a little combination of yoga. You mentioned stretching. Um, what's been effective for you? What do you think in terms of meditation? Um, you know, it, it, to me, it's all about stopping and connecting. And mm -hmm. however a person wants to stop and connect with whatever um, knowledge out, is out there is going to, whether it's prayer, uh, whether it's a, a formalized form of meditation, I think whenever we dissociate briefly from uh, all that is going on around us, it allows us to bring energy into our bodies, allows us to bring knowledge into our bodies, and it allows us most importantly to connect with ourselves. And uh, it's, a, it's a very, very profound uh, moment uh, of the day. Uh, and I think you know, plenty of research is now showing huge benefits in terms of measurable uh, parameters that relate to disease processes. So I think, um, you know, it's something that humans really have probably all, always done, yeah. along with the intermittent fasting and sleeping well and being mobile and active and doing things. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I like that you talked about it in the book because coming from you, the neurologist, people kind of say, oh yeah, I'll meditate when I need to, which, you know, it's good. a rainy day. Good, people that we'll... should meditate when they need to yeah. and they need to every day. Right. So <laughs> I'm, I'm all for that. Yeah, that's amazing. So uh, three final questions, a little bit quicker format here, Dr. Perlmutter. Mm -hmm. By the way, amazing info. I'm really grateful for having this interview with oh, you. Oh, my pleasure. It's a lot of fun. Um, so we know you're very successful. You've written three books within three years, I think. Or more? Yeah, this is, I guess, my ninth book. Yeah, very, very yeah. busy guy. So uh, we know that successful people have morning routines. So we want to know you on a little bit more of a personal level there. What do you do in the first couple hours of your day? Uh, well, one thing I don't do is eat. <laughs> so uh, the truth of the matter is, now I'm not suggesting that everybody not eat breakfast because some people need to eat breakfast for whatever reason. I'd like it ultimately to be that, that uh, you might postpone your first food till noon or even two o'clock. Uh, but I exercise in the morning, and I exercise actually quite aggressively in the morning. Uh, then I meditate, and I, I give gratitude at that moment for mm -hmm. the fact that I woke up again. Yeah. It's a great thing, but for all of the beauty uh, and wonderful things that are around me. And, you know, again, um, you know, this, this interview is going to last for a, uh, a time, but, you know, understand that right now we're, uh, we're not looking good right now. This is before mm -hmm. the presidential election, and so... Um, I think it, to distance ourselves from negativity is really very, very important. Yeah. The other thing I do in the morning is I write, whether it is uh, related to writing a book or a scientific paper or even trying my hand at poetry. Who knew? Yeah. Uh, and I play the guitar every day as well. That's awesome. Yeah. So the writing, that creative outlet, you find that to be stimulating for the brain first thing in the morning? Is that what we're saying? 
I do, and you know, yeah. my writing is, I don't really type that well, so my writing is actually eyes closed with headphones on and a microphone to a transcription mm. uh, app. And so it allows me to uh, frame in my thoughts. Once they are memorialized in that fashion mm. and corrected, grammar corrected, uh, it's a great exercise for me to really learn material because because then I'll read that again and it uh, sticks. Usually, yeah, and the, the stuff, oddly enough, that I write about is stuff that I thought about while I was running. And wow. I can't wait to get home, grab a quick shower, then sit down and dictate that stuff yeah. because um, I think there's a lot of creativity during exercise that people mm -hmm. don't harvest because they're, wa you know, they got headphones on, they're on a treadmill watching the news and, you know, imbibing negativity while they, this could be a time of real uh, soul searching and positivity. Yeah, that's a wonderful tip. I really, really appreciate you sharing that. So uh, if there's one herb, nutrient, or botanical, you could not live without vitamin D, omega-3s are covered. What would it be and why? Oh, good. Well, it would have been vitamin D, but it's covered, and yeah. omega-3s are, are covered. I'll go with magnesium. Okay. Yeah. And I think uh, when you take a step back and recognize that magnesium is you know, a pivotal cofactor in more than 300 fundamental enzyme systems in human physiology, uh, and how we manufacture DNA, how we make RNA, how we make protein, the, the basics of, of oxidative phosphorylation, of how we make energy from the food we eat, uh, magnesium would absolutely be on that list. And more than half of Americans are getting less than the RDA, which is really low anyway, of magnesium. Yeah, wonderful nutrient. So final question here, Dr. Perlmutter, you travel the world a lot. Uh, if you were to bump shoulders with someone from the World Health Organization, uh, Prime Minister of Canada, future president of the US, in 30 seconds, what health lifestyle, what tip would you want them to know maybe they can influence policy around? Well, I'm, gonna, I'm going to meet with the Prime Minister okay. of Canada uh, Next year, so I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, burn that answer on him. Yeah. So who is the other? Another uh, just anyone, anyone head of the World Health Organization. Sure. I would say kudos to you. You're doing a great job. Why? Because the World Health Organization is really pushing the envelope here and letting us know a that chronic diseases are what threaten the health of the planet most, and b as you will know, just this week the WHO issued a call for a global tax on sugar sweetened beverages. Mm. Hey, you, you get my vote, whoever you are. I mean, obviously, the head of the WHO isn't totally in charge of policy, but uh, for them to come out, I mean, they're the people who determined that glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, is a probable human carcinogen. So they are, they're less restrained than medical journals in coming out with uh, statements, I think, that are very meaningful and powerful. Yeah, beautiful. That's fantastic. So, Dr. Perlmutter, I really appreciate you coming on. I know if folks uh, purchase the new book, there is a bonus material. Do you want to talk about how they can get access well, to it? Well, with uh, Grain Brain Whole Life Plan, this is our new book, yeah. uh, if you go to my site, which is drperlmutter.com, there's a click, and uh, it'll allow you a, uh, a download, which is free, uh, from my public television program, which was Brain Maker, mm -hmm. which dealt with... Uh, gluten and carbs and sugar, and I think it's great information to have. Fantastic. Keep up great. the great work. Thank Thanks you, so much. Good to see you as always. That was great.